Today, we are going to be looking at how Christ honored his mother, and we will then use that as inspiration for how we relate not only to our own mothers, but also to God himself. Let's have a word of prayer. Abba, Father, you in your infinite wisdom knew that each of us needs a mother. And there's not a single person here that exists without a mother. And so, Father, we thank you for the gift of mothers. We're thankful for the fact that Mothers make things happen. They are the ones who raise us and instruct us in the ways of righteousness. And Father, we just want to look at a moment in time of how Jesus treated his own mother. And may we draw inspiration from that. So Father, I ask that you hide me in the cleft of the rock and allow the love and the light of Jesus Christ shine forth through this message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 19. Let's look at that verse again. John 19, 26 through 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Here, Jesus is speaking to someone called the disciple whom he loved. Inspiration confirms for us that this is the disciple John. That's correct. And in fact, he is the one who wrote this gospel account. And the other person that Jesus is speaking to is Mary, his mother. You know, the New Testament tells us very little about Mary. The name occurs 54 times in the New Testament but there are six different women named Mary, including Jesus' mother. The very first time Mary is mentioned is in the genealogy of Christ, and then she's mentioned when she's visited by Gabriel, who tells her that she's going to conceive and bear a son and call his name Jesus. And then next, Mary visits Elizabeth, who is Mary's maternal aunt and the mother to John the Baptist. Then Joseph and Mary make the trek to Jerusalem, where Jesus, I mean, not Jerusalem, Bethlehem, where Jesus is born. And Joseph and Mary then take Jesus to the temple for his dedication. Then 12 years later, they go back to the temple where Jesus is lost. Have you ever lost your children, parents? Come on, be honest. (laughs) Some of us have, that's right. You're like, oh, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. And incidentally, by the way, the reason this happened was back then, men traveled together and women traveled together. So they weren't necessarily with each other. So that's how they went for three days. And they had to backtrack all the way back to the temple, and there was Jesus discussing, debating uh, theological themes with the religious leaders, and that's when he recognized who he was. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Eighteen years later, Mary is with Jesus at the wedding in Cana, where Jesus performs his first miracle, and then the very last time Jesus visits Nazareth, Mary's mentioned there, and Jesus asks the question, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And we already saw uh, Mary at the cross, and that was with Jesus and John. And then finally, Mary is last mentioned as being in the upper room during Pentecost. Her name 
Maria is a form of the name Miriam, who is the famous sister of Moses, and that name was very common in, in those days among Jewish women, and that's why you have six different women that are named Mary in the New Testament. Tradition tells us that she was born in Jerusalem, but apocryphal sources say that Mary was born in Nazareth to da as a daughter to parents named Hakim and Anne. Wherever she was born, Mary's life was most likely unfolded in the town of Nazareth there in the hill of Galilee. Interestingly enough, Mary is revered by Muslims. And in fact, in the Quran, there are 114 surahs or chapters, and the 19th is named Mary. And if you look at the Quran, there are actually only eight chapters that are named after people, and Mary happens to be one of them. Mary is also venerated by the Roman Catholics. They have this doctrine called the Immaculate Conception, which states that Mary was conceived without any stain of sin. And this dogma also continues that from the first moment of her existence, Mary was preserved by God from the lack of sanctifying grace that afflicts mankind, and that she was instead filled with divine grace. And furthermore, that Catholic doctrine teaches that she lived a life completely free from sin. But the Bible tells us otherwise, right? In Luke 1, 46 through 47, Mary herself confesses that she is a humble or low estate and that she also rejoices in God, her Savior, her Savior. So going back to the text that Patricia read, we notice that Jesus' statement is just one of seven times that Jesus speaks at Calvary. You could preach a sermon on each of these statements. And speaking of sermon, here's another interesting sermon that you could preach. In the, in the chapter, uh, in the book, John, chapter 19, where we're talking about woman, behold your son and behold your mother, in there, you will find that there are four exclamation, all of them with the word behold. Behold the man, king, son, and mother. Back in the late 1800s, Brooke Foss Westcott wrote how these statements paint a remarkable picture of what Christ is and what he revealed men to be. And so this is an interesting topic to look at. We're not gonna get into that right now, but we're gonna look more at how Jesus related to his mother. So if you look in scriptures, there is no scriptural record of Jesus ever referring to Mary as mom. No mention of Jesus saying, hey mother, nothing like that. In fact, I can only find three passages that records Jesus actually speaking to or addressing Mary. The first one we looked at here was on Calvary. The second one was when he was 12 years old in the temple. And the third time was when he was performing his first miracle at the wedding in Cana. And notice how he addressed her when he actually addressed her. Mothers, how would you like it if your son or your daughter referred to you as woman? Come on, anyone? Nobody? Oh, see, and this is why, the reason why this happens is because in English, we're not used to using titles. But in the Eastern culture, titles are how you refer to other people. And you don't refer to them by name. But... I will say, at least it wasn't bra, right? Apparently, there's enough children out there calling their moms bra that there are memes about this and there's merchandise about this. Regardless, when Jesus answered, woman, what does this have to do with me? What have I to do with thee at the wedding at Cana? This answer, abrupt as it seems to us, expressed no coldness or discourtesy. The Savior's form of address to his mother was in accordance with Oriental customs. It was used towards persons to whom it was desired to show respect. For those of you who speak Korean, it's the same thing as saying, ajumma. 
Nowadays, even in Korea, they don't do that. They say, nuna or anni. But um, every act of Christ's earthly life was in harmony with the precept he himself had given. Honor thy father and thy mother, Exodus 20, 12. On the cross, in his last act of tenderness toward his mother, Jesus again addressed her in the same way as he committed her to the care of his best loved disciple. Both at the marriage feast and upon the cross, the love expressed in tone and look and manner interpreted his words. And folks, it's something that I even struggle with, with my tone, look, and manner. We all need to improve on how we communicate with one another and ensure that we do it with love like Jesus did. Well, at the cross, by entrusting Mary to John, Jesus is honoring his mother. And by honoring his mother, Jesus is demonstrating perfect obedience to God's law by keeping which commandment? Which one? Number five, that's right. Incidentally, when Jesus was on the cross and he died and he was laid to rest, he was also keeping the Sabbath. We're going to talk about both the fifth and the fourth commandment a little bit later, okay? And how Jesus kept those things and why that's important for us. So let's talk about first the fifth commandment. Exodus 20, 12 tells us to honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a what? A promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then, if you look in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, it tells us, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive. In the King James, it says, subject to them. When was this happening? This happened after he was 12 and he was at the temple, right? And they lost him. But after this event, he went back with them to Nazareth and was submissive to them. He was subject to them. Now, what does it mean to be submissive or subject? Well, quite literally, it means to be obedient. Obedient. You'll notice here that his mother treasured up all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in what? Wisdom, stature, favor with God and man, okay? We're talking about the totality of a human existence, right? And when Jesus decided to go back to Nazareth with them, he was obedient to them. Now, what just transpired there at the temple? He recognized who he was, right? Because just a few verses earlier, he said, did you not know that I'm about my father's business and he saw the sacrifices he saw those things and then it dawned on him that he was the paschal lamb so at this point in time could he have ventured out on his own and began his ministry probably because he actually at that point in time recognized who he was but instead he chose to be subject to his parents so, in verse 49, you can see very clearly that Jesus, in a sense, is disclaiming sonship to Joseph and Mary, and he's recognized that his heavenly Father is his true authority. And yet, Jesus nevertheless dutifully submits to his earthly parents as a son should be expected to submit to his parents. So, how old was Jesus when he realized he was the Son of God? 12. And when did he finally leave home to begin his ministry? At the age of 30. Whoa. 
So for 18 years after he realized he was the son of God, he was still subject to his earthly parents. So for 30 years before he left home, Jesus remained dutiful as a son to those who were his earthly guardians. As a son of God, he might have considered himself exempt from parental jurisdiction. I know there are a lot of us young people here that are like, man, I don't want my parents around, right? How old was Jesus when he finally gave that up? 30. I know you're like, we're in America. In America, I'm an adult at 18. Jesus was subject to his parents until the age of 30. Why? Because instead of considering himself exempt from parental jurisdiction, he sought to be an example to all youth and in the uh, duty of obedience to his human parents. It was Jesus himself who commanded men to honor their parents, for he himself was the living example of this principle. And so for 30 years, he was a loving, obedient, attentive son. And I would submit that the grandest gesture, the grandest demonstration, the grandest example of him honoring his earthly parents took place at the cross. As the eyes of Jesus wandered over the multitude about him, one figure arrested his attention. I'm reading from the book, The Desire of Ages. At the foot of the cross stood his mother, supported by the disciple John. She could not endure to remain away from her son, and John, knowing that the end was near, had brought her again to the cross. In his dying hour, in his dying hour, Christ remembered his mother. We've talked about the excruciating experiences that a person goes through on the cross, you can look that up, go on our YouTube channel and look up the word patibulum, and I go through the mechanics of the crucifixion. Sometimes it was a four-day to nine-day process, and it was excruciating on purpose. But even while he was in this situation, he looked down into her grief-stricken face and then upon John, and he said to her, woman, Behold thy son, and then to John, behold thy mother. And John understood Christ's words and accepted the trust, and he at once took Mary to his home, and from that hour cared for her tenderly. Listen to this last sentence. O oh, pitiful, loving Savior, amid all his physical pain and mental anguish, he had a thoughtful care for his mother. One of the final acts of Christ was to demonstrate the importance of the filial relationship. And in honoring his earthly mother by entrusting her care to his disciple John, Jesus was, in fact, honoring whom? In honoring his earthly mother, he was, in fact, honoring his heavenly father. That's right. And this is where the fourth commandment comes in. We live in a day and age where people are honoring their parents more and more? More and more? No, we're living in a day and age. Look at the world around us. We don't have even complete homes. We have broken homes. And even children nowadays, they don't honor their parents. This is because, I submit, that we as human beings don't recognize our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Thus, come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the work of Elijah is to do what? Restore the relationship between parents and children. And that's what you get here in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. So who is our Father? Who's our Father? 
God is, that's right. God is our Father. If you had any doubt, here's the text in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6. Is this the way you repay Jehovah, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your Father, your Creator who made you and formed you? We learned about worshiping the Creator today in Sabbath school, correct? We worship the Creator God, who is also our Father. And interestingly enough, Jesus is referred to as the everlasting Father, right? So this text here confirms the idea of the father-child, parent-child relationship between God and us. I will submit that for you to have any sort of identity as to who you are, you need to know where you came from. You need to know your origins. For, you, for me to know myself, I need to know my parents. Does this make sense? Thus, to know me is, in fact, to know my parents. Let me let Jesus explain this a little bit better. You'll see there in John 14, 7, he says that if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then in John 8, 19, they said to him, therefore, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father, if you knew me, you would know my father also. How many of you here are self-existent? Not a hand. How many of you here all have parents? We all do. How many of you knew your name the moment you were born? Who had to tell you your name? Your parents. In fact, everything about you in your formative e years, who shaped that? Who helped craft that? Your parents. You keep doing this and you go, keep going backwards, right? And then you, all, you end up all the way to, you know, the son of, let's see, it says Adam. No, it says Seth, the son of Adam, the son of, I'm quoting scripture. That's right, God, that's right. So you go all the way back and you, then you recognize the ultimate source, the ultimate father, the ultimate provider, the parent is none other than God. None other than God. So in other words, your existence is dependent upon your predecessors. Does this make sense? Okay. So our parents gave us life and existence and that's why God commands us our filial duty to express gratitude and respect to our parents for our own existence and life. And this concept is emphasized there in the book of Exodus. You can see these are pretty striking. Excuse the pun. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Wow, isn't that a little strong, God? I mean, come on, there are some times I want to tell off my parents. And you're saying if I curse them, I'm going to be killed? Oh, and there's some times, God, I want to just punch my parents in the face. I, I get angry at them, and I want to be violent. And you're saying if I do that, and I get in a fight with them, that I'm going to be put to death? How does this make any sense? Both of these commands not only deal with my moralistic behavior, because obviously it's not morally acceptable to strike and curse others, correct? Right. But if you do this particularly with your parents, this actually has a direct impact on your existence. If you cursed your parents, what are you essentially saying? That you, did, you wish that they would have not existed, right? So if they didn't exist, how in the world would you have existed? If you are at a point where you're ready to strike your parents, you are acknowledging they don't mean anything to you. And if they mean nothing to you, how in the world would you have existed without them? 
You see, the attitude and mindset that I have when I strike or curse my parents is an attitude or mindset where I'm in essence denying or negating the source of my very own existence. This is why God commanded to take away my existence or life if I struck or cursed my parents. Remember, this is dealing with just my earthly mother and father. Obviously, it's that much more serious when we deal with our heavenly father. Acts tells us that we exist because God creates us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So as we understand this concept, that our life is dependent on our predecessors, that our life in existence comes from our parents, comes from their parents, comes from their parents, all the way back up to Adam, and that human existence and life came from God himself. When we understand this, we will naturally want to thank and honor and worship him who created, because he is the one who created us and sustains us. And when you live life, like, live life like this, this becomes a life of faith. In other words, your faith is the reasonable, logical, and biblical understanding of your existence in relationship to God. That you recognize that God is the source of your existence. Therefore, the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment actually teach the same concepts it's just that the direct object is different. What do I mean by this? The fourth commandment describes my relationship with God, and the fifth commandment describes my relationship with my parents. The fourth commandment teaches us that the reason for our faith is the origin of our existence. The fifth commandment teaches us that what is proper and natural to do while I'm existing. In other words, the fourth commandment teaches us about our origins of life, and the fifth commandment teaches us how to continue that life through successive generations. Thus, it's interesting to see, and it's significant to see these two ideas merge together in the book of Leviticus in Chapter 19, 1 through 3. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, Jehovah your God, am holy. Verse 3. Every one of you shall revere or honor his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. You notice the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment melded together there? Why? Because I am Jehovah your God. God. Just as we keep the seventh day Sabbath as part of our religion, Christians will honor their parents as part of their religion. Amen? Amen. Do you not agree? The prophet tells us this, Desire of Ages, 752. The perfect example of Christ's filial love shines forth with undimmed luster from the mist of ages. For nearly 30 years, Jesus, by his daily toil, did what? Helped bear the burdens of the home. Children, you ought to be bearing the burdens of the home. Amen. Try to look for things to make yourself useful. Be productive. L lighten the load on your mom. Just your mom. <laughs> and now, even in his last agony, he remembers to provide for his sorrowing widowed mother. The same spirit will be seen in every disciple of our Lord. What kind of spirit? What's the same spirit? What kind of spirit is this? It's Christ's filial love shining forth with undimmed luster, right? His willingness to provide for his sorrowing and widowed mother. His willingness to help lighten the burdens of the home. This same spirit will be seen in disciples of Jesus Christ. Those who follow Christ will feel that it is a what? Part of their religion. 
to respect and provide for their parents. From the heart where his love is cherished, father and mother will never fail of re receiving thoughtful care and tender sympathy. It was a bitterly cold winter evening in Korea in 1952. A pregnant young mother, Mrs. Yun Park, hobbled through the snow toward the home of a missionary friend where she knew she could find help. And tears of sorrow froze on her face as she mourned her husband's death because he had been recently killed in the Korean War. How many of you ever lived through a war? No, a real physical war. Yeah, I know my parents have. They both, both grew up during the Korean War. Well, Mrs. Yoon's husband was killed in the Korean War, and she had no one else to turn to. A short way down the road from her missionary friend's house, there was a deep gully spanned by a bridge, and as Mrs. Park stumbled forward, her birth pains suddenly overcame her. She fell. And realizing she could go no further, she crawled under the edge of the bridge. And under there, alone, under the bridge, her baby boy was born. Ms. Park had nothing with her except her heavy padded clothes. And so one by one, she removed all pieces of her clothing and wrapped them around her tiny son still connected to her body through the umbilical cord. And then, feeling exhausted, she lay back down in the snow beside her baby. The next morning, Miss Watson, the longtime missionary, drove across that bridge in her car to take a basket of food to a needy Korean family. And on her way back, as she got near the bridge, her car sputtered and died out of gas. She got out of the car and started across the bridge, and through the crunching snow under her feet, she heard another sound, a baby's faint cry. She stopped, unbelieving, and heard the cry again. Oh, it's coming from underneath the bridge. She crawled under the bridge to investigate, and there she found a tiny, bundled baby, warm but hungry, but young Miss Park frozen to death. So she ran back to her car, grabbed a knife from the toolbox, and she cut the cord and took the baby home with her. After caring for the baby first, along with some helpers, she brought Mrs. Park's body back to the, uh, where she, near where she lived and buried Miss Park there. She named the baby Sue, Sue Park, and adopted him. He was strong and healthy, and he grew up with many of the other orphan children that Miss Watson was caring for. But to her, Sue was special. She often told him, your mother had great love for you. And then she would tell to him how Sue's mother proved that self-sacrificial love. And he never tired of hearing about his beautiful mother. One day on Christmas, his 12th birthday, the snow was coming down, and the children had helped Sue celebrate his 12th birthday. Afterwards, he sat down beside Miss Watson. Mother Watson, do you think God made your car run out of gas the day you found me? Perhaps he did, she answered. If that car didn't stop, I would not have found you, but I'm so glad it stopped. I love you, and I'm so proud of you. She put her arms around him, and he rested his head against her. Mother Watson, would you please take me out to my mother's grave? I just want to pray there. I want to thank her for my life. Yes, but put on a heavy coat. It's, it's pretty cold out there. And so besides the grave, Sue asked Mother Watson to wait at a little distance, and she walked in aside and, and waited. 
And as the astonished missionary watched, the boy began to take off his clothing, piece by piece. Surely he won't take off all his clothing, she thought. He'll freeze. But the boy did strip himself of everything, and he laid it on his mother's grave. And he knelt naked and shivering in the cold. And Miss Watson waited one minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then he went o- she went over to him and put her gloved hands on his snow-covered shoulder. Come, Sue, put your, put your clothes on. I will help you dress. Then in deep sorrow, he cried out. Were you colder than this for me, mother? And he wept bitterly because she knew, of course, he knew, of course, she was. Friends, Jesus stripped himself of all his royal garments to come and live among us. Was he cold for us? Surely, we never have to wonder if he loves us or even how much he loves us because he demonstrated that to us nearly 2,000 years ago, not only by dying on that cross, but by also honoring his mother. And so on this Mother's Day weekend, I ask that you celebrate Christ's love for us. And my appeal is very simple. Will you, particularly you young people, will you honor God by honoring your parents, especially your mother? Let's pray. Father God, in you we live and move and have our being. I pray that you give us the mind of Jesus Christ so that we shall honor our mother and father and keep your Sabbath as part of our religion. Thank you for our mothers. Bless them with health. And may we show the world that we are Christians by our love for one another, especially to our parents and our moms. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.